Good after oh. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you all. Oh, Mayor Cohen, nice to meet you. Hi. So um, thank you for being here. It's so excited to see all of you. It's a, this is a regional housing strategy gathering, um, and um, Daphne uh, Zhu is here to present, uh, do the presentation for um, the city of Middleton's um, zoning code update, which is very exciting. Um, but before we do that, um, one of the things that we really found helpful as part of the regional housing strategic planning process is really just um, getting to know each other, relationship building. So if you wouldn't mind um, introducing yourself, we'll pass the mic, who you are, and um, yeah, what you think of zoning or planning or, yeah, anyway. So start with the mayor. Thank you so much. My name is Emily Kuhn. I am the mayor of Middleton. And it's been an honor to work with Daphne and Abby and the team here. Um, the reason I wanted to come out and support this is because it's been 40 years since the city of Middleton has done our zoning change. I uh, went to grad school for public policy and community development, and they told me when your planners come to you and say we need change, support them. So I want to say that that may not be your experience, but if you can borrow any best practices or you need some ideas, the staff here are amazing. And if need be, I can share an idea or two. Hi, I'm, I'm Gabriella Gerhardt. I'm an alder in the city of Fitchburg. Uh, here to learn a little bit more. I'm on the plan commission and I also work for Habitat for Humanity. So thanks. Hi, I'm Kim Johnston. I work with Pace Wisconsin and I've been meeting with a lot of you over the last year. Hi, I'm Becky Bins. I'm the housing planner with the city of Sun Prairie. Uh, Andrew Bremer, community and economic development director for McFarland. Hi, uh, Nick Miles, zoning administrator with the city of Stoughton. Hi, I'm Brian Mooney. I'm the village administrator in Cross Plains and a city of Middleton resident. Hi, I'm Tim. I'm the mayor for the city of Stoughton. Hello, Mike Engelberger. I'm uh, Dane County Supervisor uh, for the Stoughton area. Hi, my name is Rafael. I'm an architect with Gorman and Company. Hi, Jenna Wathridge, Housing Program Specialist with Dane County. Hi, everyone. Ashley Bowig with Dane County. Good afternoon, y'all. Matt Freider. I'm a Community Development Specialist with the City of Madison and President-Elect of the Wisconsin Chapter of the American Planning Association. Hi, I'm Kurt Paulson. I teach urban planning and housing at UW-Madison and a proud City of Middleton resident. Uh, Lauren Dietz, I'm the Community Development Director for the Village of Wanakee. So this is my first time here. You may have seen Tim Semin here before me. He is retired. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Taylor Rosman. I'm the Housing Stability Director at Way Forward Resources, formerly MOM. So I basically could have walked here. <laughs> Hi, Regina Vitiver. I'm on the Madison Common Council and running for Dane County Executive. Hi, I'm Abby Attune, Director of Planning and Community Development for City of Middleton. Awesome. Thanks. Great turnout today. So I think today we're going to... Um, uh, Daphne's going to present for 20, 25 minutes or that, thereabout, and then we'll just open it up for Q&A. So anyway, thanks again for coming and welcome. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Daphne Shu. I'm with the city of um, Middleton, um, and I think zoning is going to be pretty dense. So if you do have any questions like in the middle of this or, you know, anything, feel free to stop and we can go over some of those things as well. Um, so. Um, this is the outline of what we're going to go over today. Um, you know, we're going to start with context, why we did this whole process, um, the process for how long it took and all of that. Um, I'm going to go over some of the nitty gritty old versus new, what is, you know, what has changed. Um, some other considerations that we actually didn't take in our zoning ordinance, but some other communities might be interested in, um, and then some lessons learned. Um, so the context, as Mayor Kuhn said, um, our, 
our last ordinance was adopted in 1984, so it was 40 years old. Um, I, it, it's my personal opinion, but I'm sure it's most of our opinions. That was pretty suburban development um, patterns. You can see um, in that chart, we only had four um, residential zoning districts. The highest density one was eight to 14 units per acre. Um, and so it was, you know, basically what we found was no one was using these um, zoning districts. Um, and that was from, um, we found that 100% of our new platted subdivisions since 2007 were in planned development districts. So that's kind of Middleton's version of the planned unit development or general development plan. Um, so, and these are, you know, single family home subdivisions. They were not using our single family zoning district. Um, so we felt, you know, there's a lot of things that we should probably update and change about that. Um, also, in addition, 100% of our new housing since 2016 were in these PDDs. Um, so that includes apartments and all these other things. Um, and that's only from basically when I stopped counting. I didn't go further than 2016. Um, so it could be very likely the same as, you know, our platted subdivision since 2007. Um, and so, as I said, we had too many PDDs in Middleton, um, over 70 um, PDDs um, is what, what we manage here in our, our department. Um, basically, everything that's purple slash light grayish purple, um, those are all PDDs. So almost a third of the land in Middleton was in a PDD. Um, and it, um, as you can imagine, it takes a lot of staff time every time, you know, some someone wanted to make a change in their development, you know, add balconies or something, they would have to go back to a plan commission meeting in order for that to, you know, be passed. Um, and so it was a lot of meetings. Um, these are the minimum number of meetings for the developers um, that they would have to go through in order to get a PDD zoning district um, under our former ordinance. Um, and so this is a minimum because as I'm sure most of you are familiar with, if you go to a committee, they might refer to a different committee and then refer to another committee. And so, you know, the meetings definitely add up and it's not just for the developers, you know, for staff, we have to, you know, if it gets um, like recommended to parks and rec committee, we have to update our parks and rec staff, you know, to for them to be able to understand what was going on. It just, it took a lot of time. Um, and so we were, hoping to get away from that. And so, um, you know, our desired outcomes, um, we really found that, you know, even our subdivisions were not using our R1 single family district. So um, we wanted to update our code to reflect more modern development and land use practices, um, cut down our, on our PDDs, um, and then really just provide more flexibility overall. Um, some other things we wanted to have was improving standards for exterior building materials. Um, this was actually developed kind of from our PDD process. We were able to see, you know, what, what people liked in the PDDs, what people didn't like, and incorporate those into, you know, codify them into our ordinance. Um, and then finally, incentivize sustainability, promote walkability, um, and all of those things as well. Um, so this is our timeline. Um, I'm starting with uh, March 2021 when we adopted our comprehensive plan because that kind of kicked off everything else in this process. Um, and so, you know, in our comprehensive plan, I think we had like 20 or 30 actions on their own that said, you know, update this in the zoning code, add this to the zoning code. And so, you know, 20 actions is quite a bit in a comprehensive plan. Um, so, you know, later, just two months later, we signed an agreement with Vandewall to help us um, with a, um, you know, start looking at the code. Um, and then for basically the next year, all of that work with Vandewall was internal with just staff, you know, developing what districts we wanted, you know, what we would like to see. The year after that was when we kind of went into our, you know, working groups and bringing it to plan commission. So our plan commissioners could understand more of the big policy things. So that's when they were discussing things like ADUs, parking, you know, um, kind of density requirements, stuff like that. And then finally, um, our first draft that was released for public was this past September. Um, and then from September, um, we had five open houses. So for people to come and, um, you know, learn about what the zoning code was, you know, what was changing, all of that. Um, and that we actually e mailed out flyers with their water utility bills. Um, so, you know, anyone who lived in Middleton who paid their water <laughs> should have known um, that we were having these open houses. Um, and then, um, you know, our first public hearing was in November, um, and then council made a decision in January to 
make some changes to the ordinance based off of all the public feedback that we had been getting. And so because of those changes, we had to have a second public hearing in February. Um, they adopted it late February, for a six to two vote. Um, and then, you know, like around 10 days later, the, our zoning ordinance went into effect just like two months ago. Um, and then three days after that, we had our first ADU application. So accessory dwelling unit is what ADU stands for. Um, so for, for staff, um, the process was around 15 hours of work each week. Um, and it would definitely ramped up, you know, the last six months of work. I think Mark Opitz was probably like waking up to zoning and going to bed to zoning. Um, so, you know, it's definitely heavier, you know, closer to adoption. Um, our zoning map was done in-house. Uh, me and one of our interns who knew a lot about GIS was able to do all of that um, by ourselves. So um, we saved maybe a little bit of money from Vanderwall doing that. Um, for elected officials, um, there were three main sticking points, I think, for them um, before they could approve our, our ordinance. Um, the first was bird safe glass. For those of you who don't know, it's like the film with the dots on the glass. Um, and so it adds a lot of cost to, you know, stuff like housing and things. And so for housing affordability, it wasn't that great, but it also, you know, helps a lot environmentally saving, you know, birds and, you know, eco the ecology of our, our region. Um, so there was a lot of push and pull between that. Um, airport was another contentious thing. It's it's always been a contentious thing here in Middleton. So the zoning ordinance obviously was included in that. And then finally, we had a very highly contentious zoning map discussion. And so it was really just one location, you know, what this one location should be zoned. Um, and so the two votes that I had mentioned that were against were specifically towards that one location. So they didn't really have any issues with the text, you know, the bird safe class, the airport zoning, all of that kind of, you know, everyone was on the same page on that. It was just this one location um, that was highly contentious. Out of uh, a thousand. Right, a thousand. right, yeah. We had thousands of parcels and all of that, and it was just the one location. Um, and so residents, as I said, um, they got flyers sent from water utility bills. So that's how they kind of first heard about this. Um, and then we, we had, you know, 50, 60 people come to those open houses and then another like 50, 60 people come and speak at our, our public hearings and all of that. Um, their sticking points was mostly stormwater management slash impervious surface. Um, I mean, the 2018 floods, they come up weekly still here in Middleton. So, you know, that was really important for our residents that we included something for that. Um, and then again, that one location of the zoning map was their sticking point. Um, so now I'm going to kind of deep dive into our zoning. Um, these are kind of major policy things that had changed over from the old to the new. Um, and feel free to stop me again if you have any questions. And I can send this slide out to all of you as well. I'll send it to you. Are we recording this? Yes, okay. yes, we are. Um, and so, yeah, so just starting from the top mixed use before, um, it was one unit was permitted above any commercial building. Um, and then anything above that was um, conditional use. I put one to two because if you look at the lot dimensions that were allowed, basically you you could only do like one or two units, basically. Um, in our new code, um, residential is allowed in all commercial areas, so we don't have any strictly commercial zoning. Um, all of it is mixed use zoning, um, but we didn't want all of our commercial to be eaten up by housing and all of that. And so um, we did add this, um, that commercial is only required at corners. Um, so at least, you know, the commercial aspect could be preserved at least in the corners um, of these districts. Um, density, as I said before, highest was 14. Now in certain districts, we allow 100 plus units per acre. Um, parking minimums, we used to do it based off of bedrooms. So a two bedroom would require two parking spaces. Um, and so, and, and onwards. Um, now we only allow, or we allow one space per dwelling unit. So it's, it's now counted by unit instead of bedroom. Um, we established maximums and we allowed plan commission. Um, they get to kind of choose if they want to reduce or eliminate any of those um, minimums as well. Um, then we have ADUs. So in our old code, ADUs had to be attached to the principal building. Um, they could only be up to 500 square feet and they were all, and you had to get a conditional use permit to allow that. 
Um, in our new code, um, they can be attached or detached. Um, so, you know, if someone has a detached garage and wants to put build a unit above that, that's allowed. Um, it, and it can be basically any size as long as it doesn't exceed principal dwelling unit size and obviously fit within, you know, the setbacks and whatever else we have for each district. Um, so if they have, you know, a single family, 3,000 square foot single family home, you know, they could put a 2,000 square foot ADU as long as they can, you know, fit it on their property. Um, lot sizes, um, our minimum single family lot size was 7,200 square feet. Now our minimum is 3,000. Um, and I can go into a little, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. I just so, want to share, yeah. I forgot to say that the one at the bottom, which is the by right. Oh yes, yeah, ADUs are now by right in all single family as well, yeah. So yeah, that's very different from what we had before. Um, and then finally, stormwater runoff. Before we only counted lot coverage, so that only extended to like structures themselves, like the house, the garage, the deck. Um, we didn't count things like driveways and walkways. Um, and so now we we go with impervious surface. So that includes, you know, driveways, walkways. So if someone wants to put in like a four car garage with a giant driveway, they might start thinking twice about that instead. And so that was just to help manage some of our stormwater concerns that we had heard. Um, these are six things that are completely new to our residential zoning. Um, and so first one is density bonus. We provide density bonuses in certain districts for if they do net zero or affordable housing. I have a whole slide on more of the details about that later on. Um, then the bird safe glass. So we did include bird safe glass into our ordinance um, and it's required for buildings over 10,000 square feet. Um, other parking related, so we also require EV charger ready. Um, so, you know, a certain number of spots have to be ready for EV charging. Basically, they can plop in the charger um, and be ready to go. And then we also require bicycle parking um, for all of our multifamily and mixed use districts. Um, we also included new missing middle districts. Um, so we have a single family high density, which is, you know, smaller lots, a lot closer together. Um, we have zero lot line multifamily. So this is, we've already allowed zero lot line two family. And th so this is for like, you know, if you have five or six townhomes all together, um, that's now allowed in our multifamily districts. And then um, mixed use neighborhood, which I can also, um, I have a slide on that as well later on. Um, we also require native plantings. And if they go above the requirement, those count as double for their landscaping points. Um, and then finally, the facade articulation, we have a maximum building facade length of 250 feet. Um, this was developed through our P PDD process as well, um, just because we did approve some buildings that were really, really long, um, and we saw that it was affecting, you know, walkability and everything of pedestrians. Yeah, go ahead. You were talking about articulation of the facade. Yes, okay. yeah. So, um, and then we also allow plan commission, you know, if the building is, say, 300 feet, if they do show, you know, that they, they've taken into that into consideration and have enough articulation, um, plan commission can waive that requirement as well. Yeah. Okay, so now um, diving into single family low density. Um, so our old single family code is on the left and then our new lowest density single family is on the right. Um, basically, you can see it, it's basically the same standard setbacks, you know, for four to five feet on some of these different um, standards. Um, and it's basically, yeah, just like a direct translation from our old to the new. So some um, neighborhoods in our in city in the city um, are this SRL. Um, all the other single family neighborhoods have essentially been densified. So they're allowed up to, um, we have a medium, a single family residential medium district and a high, high district. Um, and so this is specifically our, our high zoning district. And so you can see the minimum lot area is now, instead of 7,200, it's 3,000. Um, so essentially, you know, if they had a 7,200 square foot lot, they could subdivide into two lots and then build, you know, a second unit on that second lot. Um, and then this um, zoning district also allows under the rear setback, we do allow for alley served lots. Um, and that was, I put, it reflects our new subdivision kind of, you know, the new subdivisions we've been seeing. Like, um, I think the website of Madison has a lot of, 
you know, alley loaded lots. Um, and then, you know, Middleton Hills, we always think of as, you know, they have like the really small lots with the alleys in the back. Um, and so, um, but also like downtown Middleton, also um, parts of it could qualify for this high density because, you know, they just have such small lots that um, could really, you know, that reflected, you know, this old style of development where they, pro they promoted walkability over um, the vehicle. Um, so for multifamily low density, um, our, our, our old R3, um, we had this really weird like calculation for how to do the lot area. So if you had like a 10,000 square foot lot, you could put like three efficiency units or like two one beds and efficiency or something like that. Um, and it was really confusing. And so basically we scrapped our entire multifamily um, zoning district and we created this new multifamily residential low density. And so for multifamily, we also have a low, medium and high density zoning district. Um, and then you can see on the side setback, it says five feet or zero feet. And that's to encourage those, you know, the, like the five unit of townhomes with the zero lot line um, kind of situation. Um, and then this is our high density district. So the minimum lot area obviously went a lot larger because it's a lot higher density. Um, and then it, they also allow, you know, the side setback of eight feet or zero feet. So, you know, if they want high density townhomes, I'm not quite sure what that would look like, but it is an option um, if someone wanted to do that. And then for building height, um, we went up to five stories. So before it was only up, up to three stories. Um, and then we also have a pro pro provision in um, the medium and high density in all of our mixed use districts for the density bonus. So in high density, they can um, get two additional stories if they do the density bonus that we have. Um, so talking about those density bonuses, um, we allow it for affordable housing. So at least 50% of the units have to be affordable housing for them to be able to qualify for that density bonus. Um, and then it also has to be restricted to 60% or below um, area median income for that. And then, you know, so basically we have, we've seen a lot of, you know, developments do, you know, they'll be full affordable. And so those developments will automatically get you know, those density bonuses. Um, and then our second um, is for net zero. And so they have to be able to like design certifiable for net zero because you don't really know if it's net zero until it's been in operation for, you know, at least a year or two. Um, so we have the provision that they have to be designed up to um, the level of net zero at least. Um, and then they have to get the, it's either the International Living Future Institute or the Passive House Institute um, that, you know, do those net zero certifications. Um, so now moving on to mixed use. Um, so on the left is just our old commercial um, kind of district. And then our new one is our mixed use neighborhood. Um, as I said before, you know, anything in our old district required the conditional use permit for any residential above one unit. Um, in our new mixed use, um, you know, it's just allowed in, in any of those districts. Um, and then for mixed use neighborhoods specifically, um, I included this in our, in our missing middle kind of idea because it has a lot of the similar lot dimensions as a single family or a two family district. Um, so, you know, like 5,000 square feet, you know, five feet side setbacks, stuff like that. Um, but they're allowed, you know, commercial aspects. So it's a mixed use um, district. So they could be, you know, an office or a restaurant or something um, and then have, you know, residential in the back or above as well. Um, and then I highlighted our mixed use avenue districts. So we have neighborhood, avenue and urban are our three mixed use districts. Um, avenue, we it's like our quote unquote TOD overlay. We don't have, you know, an actual overlay that like Madison did, um, but, you know, Avenue, they go on all the avenues in Middleton, basically. So University, Century, um, and Allen. Um, and it basically is to promote, you know, the areas that have our bus service, um, you know, that goes through and then into Madison. Um, and so it, it allows a little bit extra density to support the bus services there. Um, and then in this case, um, you know, they are allowed to exceed up to six stories if they do the density bonus. 
Um, and then we also have a transition to the res residential district. So especially along like University Avenue, it's a bunch of commercial kind of strip malls right now. And then right behind our single family homes. Um, and so we've heard a lot of concerns about, you know, they don't want, you know, a five story wall right behind them. And so um, if they're right next to a residential district, um, they have to, they're only allowed a three foot or a three story um, building and then it can, they need to step it back. So then it, it's just less imposing for the residential um, districts. Um, and then again, you know, mixed use is only required at the corners. So if they're in the middle of, you know, University Avenue, they can do, um, you know, a full multifamily residential apartment. Um, if they're at the corner, they have to somehow include some kind of mixed use component. Um, I included our short term um, rental regulations because um, I think we heard from plan commission and council, they really wanted to, you know, save the single family residential um, homes um, for, you know, single family, you know, for families to actually be able to live in Middleton. Um, and so we implemented um, regulations for stuff like Airbnb, just so we could preserve that kind of housing stocks for, you know, long term rentals. Um, and so it got a lot more confusing. It's very similar, I think, to Madison's regulations. So um, basically, if you, you know, live in your house and you have, you know, an ADU or a bedroom you want to list on Airbnb, you know, you can do that whenever you want for however long you want. Um, if you live in a house and you own a different house somewhere else in Middleton, um, you're only allowed um, stays of one to six. And, you own another house and you know you're renting for people for like a weekend or something you're only allowed to rent that out for 30 days a year so essentially a month um, and then the rest of the year it's either empty or you find you know a long-term rental situation for that so you know if you have you know uw students you know they can rent it for nine months or whatever and then another month you can do for airbnbs um, and then if you're renting for six to 29 days um, you're allowed basically half a year for Airbnb. So it is a little confusing. And then, you know, it is a little bit more, you know, we're, we're asking them questions like, how many days are you renting your, you know? And so it is a little bit more intensive, but um, I think the, the purpose is to preserve those housing units for long-term rentals. Um, so now moving on to other considerations that, you know, we had discussed, but ended up not taking. Um, we discussed eliminating single family residential zoning, um, similar to like Minneapolis and all those other cities that have done it. Um, we've, a lot of the commissioners felt like maybe Middleton was not ready for something like that. Um, and so um, instead they allowed, you know, ADUs to be, you know, basically up to the same size as a principal dwelling unit. Um, and so it, it essentially does allow, you know, a second unit on the single family residential zoning, um, but, you know, not stated outright in the zoning code. Um, another thing we considered was eliminating parking requirements altogether, you know, parking minimums and all of that. Um, and so that also um, had a little bit of discussion and then they ended up allowing just plan commission is able to waive those requirements if needed. Um, and then finally, our density bonus, um, we considered doing that as a conditional use permit. So they would have to apply for a conditional use. Um, the legislation on, in Wisconsin for conditional use permits is very difficult to like understand and manage. So we just decided not to go that route. Um, and then some other density bonuses we considered was bird safe class. You know, if they did bird safe class, they could be allowed an additional floor um, or exceeding stormwater standards. And both of those um, just ended up not, not being included into our um, code. Um, so up next, as I mentioned, um, there are a lot of um, parcels that, you know, are now zoned for medium or high density. Um, which allow smaller lots. So, you know, they could subdivide their lots. So we're looking to update our subdivision ordinance because we found some issues that are very outdated with, with that ordinance as well. So we're looking to do that. Um, and then we're also tracking a lot of minor amendments. As I said, we did a whole code overhaul. So, you know, it was a lot definitely for our staff to like understand. And so now that it's being implemented, we're like, oh, we didn't actually mean, you know, some of these things, um, and most of them are pretty minor. 
Um, so we're tracking those for an amendment, I think this summer actually. So very soon we're already doing some amendments, um, but that does go into um, some lessons learned. Um, since we were doing you know, such a big change to our overall ordinance, we really wanted to get our major policy issues you know, knocked down and, and understood. And so um, that's why we went ahead with you know, adopting this ordinance, even though we knew some changes still needed to be done. Um, we wanted to get, you know, everyone was already on board. I think most of the council already was on board with all the, these, you know, density and ADUs and all these things. Um, and then, you know, we kind of went with the understanding that there will be changes, you know, over time just because it is completely new and we didn't, you know, and we weren't entirely sure, you know, what exactly would need to be changed or tweaked and all of that. Um, and then finally, um, comp plan guidance was, I think, really helpful for us in this situation since we had just done our comp plan um, in 2021. Um, you know, all of the elected officials were on board with the comp plan and how it was adopted and all, all of the, you know, strategies and actions that we had in there. And so it kind of easily translated into, okay, and now we're supporting, you know, all the zoning ordinance because it has all of these things that we agreed to in the comp plan. Um, also, the future land use map was really helpful for, you know, creating a lot of our new zoning districts. Um, so we, we were able to take the comprehensive or the, the future land use plan districts that we had and a lot of them translated into um, these new zoning districts that um, we have now. Um, and so, um, as I said, I'll, I'll send this link out probably to Olivia so she could send it to everyone else, but that there are links to our text, our map. Um, and then also our applications, those were all reworked with this new process. So, yeah, happy to take it. Sure. Do you have any pushback from uh, townships where you have extraterritorial zoning jurisdictions? Um, that is a good question. Um, so for the recording, I, I don't know if they caught it on the recording, but um, we were asked if we had any questions on or pushback from our extraterritorial zoning areas. Um, so we did, it did take a little bit of time to work through our ETZ extraterritorial zoning um, district because, you know, it, it kind of was just like a separate part of our ordinance that was like smacked on to the end. Um, and so we did have to work through that separately. Um, I don't know if we specifically had any like hard pushback, but um, sure, Mayor Kuhn, maybe you Only know. Airport. And, yeah, and they, they don't really have a right to say what our airport is, but they they definitely wanted us to consider their perspective. But the rest, I think, we yeah, chatter. It was or just late chatter, right? Like, yeah, instances, I think they just have mm -hmm. Yeah, so town of Middleton doesn't have any. Um, we don't have an ETZ um, thing with them, but we did, you know, take their input when when they were talking about the airport and the rest of our zoning. Um, with Westport, we do have an ETZ um, agreement and, you know, they just basically said, you know, we don't want your higher density stuff. It's, it is a little, it was like, you know, very different from, from what they had before. Um, so we kind of just reworked our existing one that we had with them. Um, and that was what was adopted. Yeah. Never, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Can you talk more about how you married the comp plan and the height bonus? Like what, what's by right, what's conditional? Sure, yeah. Um, so the um, height bonus, oops, sorry, was not included in our comprehensive plan, um, but our comp plan did have certain, um, it did, I think in some, some of our land use districts say like heights up to X stories. Um, and we were seeing in our zoning ordinance, it wasn't quite matching up exactly. Um, and so that was when we did some of those um, density bonus considerations of, you know, either one story or two story um, to allow some of that. So the one that came to mind, I think, was like our urban mixed use is the district in our comp plan. And then we have a mixed use urban zoning district in our in our zoning code and I think in the comp plan, it said like up to 10 stories. Um, and then I think in our current one, it's like six and then you get another two stories or something like that. Um, so they, 
that is how it kind of guided our, our density bonuses, if that helps. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds <laughs> like your comp plan actually is more allows more than your zoning code. Is that what I'm hearing? Um, I I'm I can't, I'm not entirely sure on that, but I I believe that's how um the districts came to be. So then yeah. how so if you're the developer and you're coming forward and you're saying, well, I'm looking at your comp plan and it's allowing me 10 stories, but your zoning is only allowing me six. Mm -hmm. What what's really allowed? Yeah. So um, the question was, if our comp plan is showing, you know, certain stories and our zoning code is showing a different sto amount of stories, what is actually allowed? Um, we would go first off with with the actual zoning of because we we did overhaul the entire thing. So we want them to stick with, you know, what is actually allowed in the zoning. Um, and then, you know, for the density, and then if they wanted to go higher than that, they would have to go through the density bonuses to get, you know, those one or two additional stories um, in that case. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, can you talk about what type of public engagement you did as you were developing that draft plan? I, your graphic kind of showed it on the, on the tail end of about a year's work yeah. of staff work, but I'm wondering, Sort of going through that process and then in particular around the hot button topics which would likely be single family only yeah ADUs, some of that yeah so i'm just going to go back to this graphic um yeah the question was how we handled a lot of the public input um and so basically that first year from 2021 to 2022 there was basically no public input because we didn't even really know what what the ordinance would even look like at that point. Um, and then from April, 2022 to May, 2023, um, that's when we started getting more of that, I guess, public input. It was, you know, all of the, the documents were available on our, on our city's website. So if people were interested in looking at it, they could. Um, we had like a specific web page built for, for the zoning code update. Um, and then, you know, all of the policy documents that plan commission reviewed, that was at plan commission. So if people were interested, um, I don't think there, maybe there were some developers that had come to those meetings because they were interested um, in the certain policies that we were talking about. But um, yeah, all of those were done during, you know, public meetings, but we hadn't really received any actual public feedback um, until we reached out to them via the water utilities and all of that. Yeah. I need, I need graphic here. What, who consisted of the work group? Yeah, that's a great question. So our work group was a member of our Zoning Board of Appeals, um, a member of our Plan Commission, um, and then a member of our Sustainability Committee. I think those were the three that were involved. Um, the Zoning Board, obviously, because they saw all the appeals that were coming through and you know what people were trying to get appeals for. Um, and then the plan commission, obviously, with all the recent developments and then sustainability, just because um, we felt that sustainability was a key piece to our our ordinance and basically everything we do as a city. Um, so we wanted their feedback as well. You, I'll just follow up. You mentioned that earlier you had five open houses. Yes. Was that when, at what point was that in the process? Um, so the five open houses were after um, we had revealed our, unveiled our draft to the public. Um, and so, yeah, so that was after a lot of the policy discussions had gone through plan commission and all of that. Um, and then we went to the public to to get their feedback. Was, was that over like three or four weeks? Just yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it was like four, four or five weeks, I think. We had one basically every week. Um, it was either at across the street in the library or at Cromery Middle School. Um, so those were pe places that people were more familiar going to as well, instead of coming here in City Hall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is it seriously staff motivated um, that once you got the comprehensive plan in, staff was looking at it and saying, hey, zoning code doesn't really work. Um, or was it a combination of staff and elected officials or appointed officials? Um, kind of how did this get initiated? Yeah, maybe Abby could better, or Kurt, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it, was, it probably, a lot of um, our elected officials and commissioners don't really get in the weeds that much on zoning. And so 
they were very involved with the comprehensive plan update. And we did, I think, 28 public engagement sessions over the course of years for the comprehensive plan update. It was a long process. And so I think by the time we finished that, we already knew that we had solid support for ADUs. That was really like, we were rock solid on that. All of our elected officials were supportive. We we knew that that was not really going to be a hot button issue here because we'd already started getting um, requests from members in the community that wanted to do that for extended family um, situations and things like that. And so um, I think that that's why we chose to hold the public engagement for the zoning code later in the process. In my experience, if you don't have something to show the community, they really don't know what to tell you. Like you can't really just have public engagement, have it be completely open-ended. We tried that at the beginning of the comp plan too. And it was like, well, what are you sharing? You know? And so it's always kind of a battle because you don't want to go too late in the process because then you're criticized of doing it too late, but it's finding that sweet spot. Um, but I don't think that there was a lot of pressure coming from our elected officials to update the zoning code. It was more that we knew it was woefully outdated. And um, with so many PDDs, we had, you know, over 70 PDDs. We can't even answer the most basic question when somebody calls us and they ask us what the zoning of their property is. We're like, hold on, let me pull up the PDF that is specific to your project and maybe was written 30 or 40 years ago and doesn't even have modern standards included. And then you're you're not only tracking the original PDD, but then you're stuck tracking all of the SIP modifications that have happened over time. And some of them don't pertain to the entire PDD. Some are only for a subset of it. And we've never required the property owner to um, update it into one document. So like we're, I mean, it's it's been a mess. It's been a struggle. <laughs> so I think it was probably more staff guided to update the zoning code at that point. We knew how outdated it was. And actually Mark Opitz just joined us and he is our city planner and zoning administrator, has been with the city for over 25 years. And he was the lead staff, 25 years in June, okay. He was the lead staff person um, who worked on the zoning code with a ton of support from Daphne as well. Um, but obviously, like Mark has worked here long enough that he knows the challenges that our community has faced. He knows the community really well. And that helped make the process go a lot more smoothly, too. Related to that, maybe you can stay standing. I don't know. <laughs> um, it sounds like you did a lot of engagement with the comp plan and then fairly soon on the heels of that did quite a bit of engagement with the zoning update. And were you ever worried at all about engagement fatigue? Um, did you target some of that engagement to certain user groups um, to make sure that you know people aren't like, why are you asking me more questions? You just ask me to just ask me 50 questions a year ago. Okay. <laughs> um <laughs> well. I guess we, I mean, even though we, I, I feel like we really went above and beyond trying to engage people in the zoning ordinance process. I think like when a lot of people see like zoning ordinance open house, their eyes kind of glaze over and they're not really, so they might pinpoint their property on the map and like look around it and be like, okay, we're good. Nothing's changing. Um, <laughs> but we probably had maybe uh, maybe just under 100 people who attended all, uh, you know, in total over the five, we probably only had 100 people in a community that has 23,000 people. And I would say half were there for one piece of property specifically. So, <laughs> so it kind of, I mean, we were doing so much things, so many things that we were excited about in implementing the comp plan. And that was I think for our staff, a little bit disappointing that the process was kind of usurped by what happened to one piece of property on Allen Boulevard. <laughs> but hmm. yeah, um, the new zoning implementation talking about having ready stations or EV ready infrastructure. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was with our EV ready requirements. Um, and it's so they don't have to have the charger in place. It's just the infrastructure is is ready to be hooked up. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm wondering, 
wondering is there a demographic that um, came out in more force than others, say like the 20 plus year resident who doesn't want change versus the younger who realize that we need density, we need to be located near transportation, you know, all the things that we need for this climate. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on, on what you saw yeah, um, so the question was the demographics of people who came out to our, our engagement sessions, and it was definitely leaning closer to the 20 year resident has been there for a really long time. Um, I think that's just typical in a lot of our, our city things, you know, people who are possibly retired and so they have the capacity to be able to come out to these things. Um, even though we, we held them on like the weekends and, you know, after hours, but, you know, that's just usually how it happens. Um, we did surprisingly, I think, get, you know, people who were either developers or people, you know, people interested in, you know, maybe changing their property or updating their property. Um, and so we did get, I, I feel like we'd got a couple letters of, you know, just general support of, you know, this is a great idea, you know, you guys should be doing that, um, which that surprised me, honestly, that we got, you know, people who are supportive of, of the ordinance as well. Mm -hmm. question. Did you look at at all about um, manufactured housing? Um, I think we did. I think Mark could probably answer that best. It's in the code as um, um, it, 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 we addressed it. I don't know the specifics, but we have it. Oh, you want to say more? Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So um, manufactured house, but I don't know. <laughs> Um, so the question was related to manufactured housing. Um, it is, um, I believe we included it as a definition in our code. Um, that is something that we looked into specifically just because um, it is, you know, an affordable housing option now. Um, and so I believe it it is allowed. I don't think it's specifically, you know, other than in the definition, I don't think we specifically, you know, allow it or deny it as a permitted use and such like that. Uh, two questions. One, if you could speak a little bit more on the condition uses. Did you find that with the new code, you scaled back the amount of uses that you classified as condition use? And the second question, unrelated, is um, the mechanics of rezoning a new property and mm -hmm. the implications of that. Was it sort of a, a letter with the, hey, if you're in this district, you're moving to this district? Can you talk how you work through that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so with the conditional, the first question was with conditional uses, how we manage that. Um, we, um, as I said, worked with Vandewall and they kind of had like a template of, you know, certain definitions and, you know, what was a permitted and what was a conditional use. Um, I think, you know, we definitely, we created a lot more zoning districts than we had before. For example, we have like a, an extraction district and like a, an outdoor storage maybe district. Um, and so those were kind of separated out so that we wouldn't have to deal with a conditional use situation. So those are, you know, districts in our code, but they're actually no properties mapped on our zoning map as those kind of districts, just so we could, you know, not have to worry about that whole conditional use situation with, with um, certain certain intensive uses like that. Um, and then related to notification of properties, um, I believe we were only required to notify properties with that were down zoned. Um, and so I don't think we had a single property that we down zoned in, in Middleton. So um, we didn't have to you know send out individual letters. Um, that's why we focus so much on that water utility thing um, to make sure everyone kind of knew, you know, what was going on and, and all of that. Um, and so, yeah, for like, I don't know the exact percentage, but, you know, for around, I think, half of the people in Middleton, you know, their zoning really didn't change too much. You know, it was single family and now it's single family with, you know, slightly different setbacks and all of that. Um, so. Um, overall, the the map itself didn't really change too much. Um, it's just some people were allowed a little bit more on on their properties. Sure. Oh, 
I, I have to scoot, but I wanted to say thank you to Daphne and to Mark and Abby uh, for doing this process. It was a very long process. And the reason I wanted to step forward, uh, besides thanking you all for coming today to learn more, um, was that comment about that not in my backyard. It is really hard to hear this time and again on the plan commission and on council. I, I know it's hard for staff, they get the same emails, but you know, you're looking at what the needs are for our local businesses to have workforce. Um, when our widows can't afford property taxes and they have five bedroom, beautiful houses, but they're the only one living there, but they wanna stay in the community. And what we're finding is that some of our really new um, properties are actually locals who wanna stay in the community but don't wanna do snow removal anymore. So we decided to do a housing survey. And um, I wanna say thanks to our staff because on top of this huge lift of a zoning code ordinance update, we came up with like 30 questions to ask those kind of things. Because if in those uh, town hall meetings, we get people who have capacity to come out or are interested in planning, which is not your average voter, um, that we would have a way to understand what the, uh, the people who are quiet or who are working two or three jobs to share their perspective as well. And it's helpful because uh, sometimes we can only rely on the person in front of us, whether they're at the town hall and they're really upset about something, or they're a developer who says, yeah, all we need is lots more apartments. And, but at doors, we're hearing about single family homes. And so how do you balance those two different stakeholders? So the great thing about that is that it shared how there's a wish for everything in the housing market. Yes, there's a lot of people who wanna stay in apartments because maybe they're in school for two years here and then they're planning to move or they work for Epic and plan to buy in a couple of years. Um, there's some people who wanna to go to a bigger house when they can or can find something here. And there's uh, that 6% who actually wanna get a smaller house and they're waiting for something to open. Um, so there's no magical answer like, yes, always tall buildings, um, but there's actually a lot of demand for those apartment buildings. So the developers are right when they come in front of us and they want to build on a transit line and they want to be close to um, businesses and workplaces and have amenities, uh, but our homeowners are also right. And so uh, the Taking that step to do that extra design of survey took time, but it was really worth it to get a well-rounded answer. So um, they're happy to share anything that we've done. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Mayor. Yeah, and so to speak a little bit about what Mayor Kuhn was saying, um, this the housing survey was actually after we had, you know, adopted this, but you know, obviously we'd been hearing a lot of feedback from our residents about housing and all of that. Um, and so she was basically the one that organized this whole housing survey. I think it's still, you know, being circulated right now, even um, to residents, to developers, to people that have received TIF funding, um, stuff like that. So, so I wanted to say something on that note, because I was recently at the American Planning Association conference, and I went to, I don't know, probably as many zoning, uh, went to as probably as many zoning meetings or you know sessions as I could and there was definitely a theme that arose from those um, from those uh, sessions that um, really asked us to ask ourselves what does an equitable process look like um, because typically you have homeowners who tend to scale you know um, older white wealthy that you know come out a lot to meetings and whether it's plan commission or, or zoning the zoning board but um and really asked us to think out loud or think you know outside of the box about how we can actually engage a broader spectrum um whether it be from renters you know from all the way from renters to you know high end um across race and, and age and everything um when we are considering our processes for updating whether it's our comp plan or our zoning code and it was uh i have some examples from that i can probably 
trying to dig out for my either my notes or my uh, PowerPoints, but it was just, and uh, the regional housing strategy has stressed equity in moving forward in in you know our planning and development. So I thought that maybe it might be a good opportunity for us to have a future discussion on that and how we could make our processes um, or expand our processes. But that survey is certainly a good example um, of that. Um, but we we we're probably going to continue to face the the inevitable challenge of you know when you mention zoning people go blank and so how do you engage people around you know zoning so i think a, a zoning 101 fact sheet from the county might be helpful or why does it matter why does zoning matter to you whether you live in an apartment building or a single family home but yeah thanks i'd love to see that survey too about the density bonus and how you arrived at seven stories that is quite different from three stories and that's amazing that you guys were able to do that yeah um i think that definitely took a lot of mark's time as well to to figure out you know which which areas you know could go up or down um i think it, it was based on on our future land use map you know those areas that you know so said you know could go up to eight or ten stories um and so that that definitely helped guide you know where we wanted to see the higher density, um, and yeah, I think I think that's basically it. I don't know if Mark has anything more to add on that, on how you came up with the density bonuses. So much of it has become a blur. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you you said it earlier, Daphne, that that we were guided by Vanderwall, our consultant. Uh, I sorry, I didn't mean to crash this. I just was listening in the background a little bit. Um, yeah, we we are very much with our comprehensive plan that Abby uh, oversaw with our staff here over the last few years. We really had a commitment to these principles of density along transit corridors. That's really what we were putting in place with the with the uh, zoning ordinance. So that's that really was the main the main guide. Um, we allow by right, and I assume you covered that uh, five stories along most of our um, arterial streets now up to five stories and um, I think we actually lowered the maximums uh, if I remember right now and I had so many different numbers as in so many different districts but I think we actually uh, ended up with we have greater density throughout the city greater density throughout the city but the original proposals were for I think even uh, there were a couple districts that were even taller and we brought those down um, we didn't want to shock the city too much, <laughs> but um, we already now have, in most places, three three stories, thirty five feet or less as the standard. That was the standard until March first. So now we have the five story with the density of six or seven, depending on the criteria that are met by the applicant. I don't really have anything. I don't remember how we came up with that number specifically anymore, other than it was guided by our consultant and our comprehensive planning process. trucks did you have to get with the zone margin? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm thinking that, you know, there's always cause and effect, so. Yeah, um, that's a good question. So the question was, you know, related to like impacts of, you know, public safety and all of that. Um, we did, we, I mean, no, yeah, I'm sure it's coming. I'm sure we've already been reached out on like staffing studies for our public safety departments and stuff like that. Um, and so, I mean, having the zoning code, I think helped. I think it, it definitely is a better guide now for public safety, at least, because before it was, you know, any one of these parcels could become a PDD. And then, you know, whatever was in the PDD was, you know, just whatever, you know, was happening at the time. Um, now we have a zoning ordinance that says, you know, this is what we allow. This is, you know, so it's a, a little bit better for them to anticipate, you know, the growth and the change definitely now um, than it was before with just the random PDDs that would come up. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. That was really that was really wonderful. Thank you so much. And thanks so much for being here, you guys. Um, and uh, it was nice to see some of you for lunch at the Hubbard 
Avenue Diner. Um, and uh, I think we'll be doing this, trying to um, bring, uh, get together around zoning because it is such a hot topic right now. Um, again, in the next few months, um, whether we have a panel or we go to another municipality who's either engaged in it or recently has done, um, done, a, done a zoning update. So if you've recently done a zoning update, let me know and maybe we can put you on the... Joyce, did you did Fitchburg recently do a zoning? Oh, oh, oh! You're going to do one in 2025. Okay, got it. All right. Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe we could reach out to Verona. But um, yeah, and if you have any other ideas for these, you know, get together sessions, network meetings, please let me know. Um, uh, it's yeah, it's just a really great opportunity to see each other and and get together and and uh, remember that we're all in this together. So yeah, thank you. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Stephanie. Hi. 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 Hi.